then there's me. Now coming from the New England area, Joe Radner has been studying, teaching, telling, and collecting stories most of her life, performing them from Maine to Finland to Hawaii. According to my internet research, after 30 years of teaching literature, American studies, folklore, and storytelling as a professor at American University in Washington, DC. Joe moved to Western Maine to apply her teaching and performance skills in a career of freelance consulting and storytelling. She has worked as an oral historian and a teacher providing workshops and residencies. She uh, has worked and continues to work as a performance coach, training storytellers in individually and in groups. She has been teaching uh, storytelling to teachers at Leslie University. She is past president of the Washington DC Storytellers Theater and National Storytelling Network and served on the board of directors of Lanes, the League for Advancement of New England Storytelling. And Joe also has been busy writing and uh, being published, writing articles and on topics dealing with Irish history, Celtic studies, women's folklore and studies, American and Irish folklore, deaf culture, and New England history. And she has a CD titled Yankee Ingenuity, Stories of Headstrong and Resourceful People that received the 2013 Storytelling World Award. And in April 2013, Joe was given the Brother Blue and Ruth Hill Award from the League of the Advancement of New England Storytelling in recognition of extraordinary commitment, dedication, and loving encouragement to the New England storytelling community. And she is here to share some of her stories and her poetry with our community today. So please give a warm round of applause for Joe Radner. Thank you for that introduction, Cheryl. I uh, hardly recognize myself, but, but I am here, and I'm delighted to be here once more. I love Wake Up and Smell the Poetry, and uh, because it is poetry, I'm going to do a kind of a combination of things. I'll start with a poem, and then I'll tell a story, and I will end with a couple of poems. Uh, the first poem is actually a kind of a crossover to make sure I have my feet in both, both ponds. And its title is 13 Ways of Listening to a Story. Uh, I'm, it's wonderful to be in a place where you don't need to explain any illusions, but I'd love to say that each of the 13 stanzas of this is headed by a preposition, and that's its general structure. 13 Ways of Listening to a Story. Four, the listener hovers, dives, talons outstretched for the meat. With, in the dawnland mist, the listener glides, waiting for the birds. Without, Uninhibited listener, if you're going to disgrace your uniform, as they used to say in the Women's Army Corps, take it off. <laughs> Against. You don't want to walk, waltz? Then teach me to tango. I hear the music. Through. The story is a dark path. On the other side of the forest, I will find you. Between, Baba Yaga is on one side, Walt Disney is on the other, I am the monkey in the middle. <laughs> Within, what's that, and that, and that? Snorkeling in the coral garden, listener marvels at unimaginable fish. Around, 
Sticks and stones won't break my bones, but oh, Procrustes, don't talk me into your bed. I'm not that kind of girl. <laughs> Beyond. They wove you a gray cloak, stitched you tight boots, draped modest skirting over your knees, but I hear you chuckling, old floozy. You're wearing hot pink knickers. <laughs> Past. Distinguish every voice. It is of no importance that the jackhammers batter, black flies tear at that sensitive spot behind your ear. Your own mother is waving frantically to distract you. They need a good listening to, those voices. Inside. This is my country. I know the childless queen, the princess who cannot laugh, the malevolent minister, the innocent goofy boy under the donkey. I hear them, and I am at home. Two, I can't play both sides of the net. When I serve the ball, please send it back with care. Show me my misjudgments, my lazy backhand, my clumsy footwork. Respect my wish to play a better game. Again, and again, and again, and again. Now I'm going to tell you a story that some of you, a very few of you, I believe, know rather well. I'm going to start it with a survey. It's actually a, a pretty much true story. How many of you have ever baked a pie? How many of you have watched somebody else baking a pie? How many of you wish someday to bake a pie? Well, this goes out to all of you. It's called mandatory pie. Now I can see you. In my Freiburg, Maine family, pie was the tangible symbol of stern expectations. The stern expector was my grandfather, Augustus Henry Smith. His lean body always looked formal. He wore a necktie every day, even with a checked flannel shirt. He had a nose like the beak of an intense predatory bird. Grandpa believed that the highest virtues in life were planning and frugality. He believed that people had roles that they must fulfill and rules they must follow. Women should sew. It saved money. Women, of course, did all the cooking, but they had to be sure when they prepared a meal never to cook too much, because in Grandpa's view, leftovers were a sign of profligacy. Furthermore, meals must be served on time, breakfast at 7.30, dinner at noon, supper at 6 o'clock, and all meals must include pie. <laughs> now, when Grandpa was a child, those kinds of expectations were not uncommon. But he lived a fully conscious 98 years, and by the end of that time, they were unusual. He outlived his wife, my grandmother, by 15 years, so for a number of years, he was hiring people to do the necessary chores. And the first question for any applicant was, do you bake pies? Wiped out a lot of candidates right away. Store-bought pies were not acceptable. They were not frugal, and they didn't taste as good. Now, my, mother, my grandmother, my grandmother had lived up to all of Grandpa's expectations. She loved to sew. For my father, she sewed soft flannel pajamas that he loved. And she was a good cook, too, not only pies, but brown sugar cookies and muffins and biscuits and donuts and fried dough, all the compulsory cultural carbohydrates. 
and she taught those skills to her two daughters. Well, successfully only to one. My mother's older sister, my Aunt Beth. She was Grandpa's ideal daughter. She sewed almost all of her clothes. She raised chickens for meat and eggs. She cooked enthusiastically and frugally. She clipped her recipes from magazines aimed at thrifty home economists. They usually involved hamburger or mushroom soup or both. But for many, many years, I kept one of her clippings taped to the cabinet in my kitchen because it was somehow quintessential. It was for fried stuffed bologna horns. <laughs> I'm not going to describe them. I believe they involved cream cheese. Just let your imaginations run wild. Now, on the other hand, my mother, Marty, she was the family's domestic black sheep. She loved to dance, to read, to argue politics. She hated to cook. She said she couldn't do it. She had the great good fortune to marry a man who loved to cook. She hated to sew and said she would do it only at gunpoint. <laughs> My father asked her to sew once. It was a time when the snaps on the fly of the trousers of those wonderful pajamas my grandmother had sewn for him wore out. And he gave them to my mother for repairs and was appalled when she returned them to find that she had fixed them with safety pins. <laughs> He loved her dancing, he loved her wit, he loved her arguments, he never again asked her to sew. Fortunately, he took her to live in Manhattan where she could buy clothes at department stores. Now, people in the family accepted my mother for who she was and they loved her, but she was always troubled that in the eyes of her own father, she was somehow irredeemably defective a kind of ugly duckling in the nest. Although I think that's probably a bad metaphor because if the duckling is approaching 50 and it still hasn't turned into a swan, it's probably just an ugly duck. <laughs> but it was when my mother was turning 50 that her mother, my grandmother, died. And all of us, I, my mother and father, Aunt Beth and Uncle Bob, all of us converged on Freiburg to be with Grandpa on that occasion. And the first evening we were there, it occurred to all of us at just about the same moment that the next day we were going to have to serve Grandpa his dinner at noon on time. And before Aunt Beth could leap in with one of her frugal casseroles, my father spoke up, he said, I'll cook a steak dinner. Not frugal at all. It was all right, except my father was from West Virginia. It's a state with perfectly good cooks, but he had not grown up with the tradition of mandatory pie. He did not bake. And as this realization was sinking in, my mother spoke up. She said, I'll bake the pie. It was a stunned silence. <laughs> she looked so hopeful. I said, I'll help. I had no more idea than she did how to bake a pie. Well, no one else said anything. And she went off and found an old Fanny Farmer cookbook and we rounded up ingredients and and then the next morning, I went to the A&P and I bought a pile of apples, and then I cored them and peeled them and sliced them while my mother wrestled, that's the right word, wrestled with the pie crust. She would roll it out, it would stick to the rolling pin, she'd scrape it off, add more flour, roll it out, <laughs> scrape it off, add more flour, roll it out, scrape it off, add more flour. For a long time, until finally she arrived at two acceptably round crusts. She fitted one into the pie pan. 
I added a mountain of apple slices, and then I read her the recipe while she added the seasonings. Cloves, dump. Nutmeg, dump. Cinnamon, dump. Lemon juice, sugar. Dot it with butter, <laughs> dot, 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 dot. Finally, she took the second crust, fitted it on top, sealed it around the edges, and took a knife and stabbed a few vents in the top of this mountain, as Fanny Farmer said to do, and put it in the oven. Now, in all this time, no one else had come near the kitchen. But as the pie began to bake, the aroma spread through the house, and people were breathing deeply and smiling in anticipation. We served dinner almost at noon. The steak was all right, a, a little too pink for the New England sense of safety. <laughs> and then I cleared the dishes, and my mother brought out the pie. It was magnificent, a golden dome. She looked so eager. She set it down in front of Grandpa. He picked up the pie server and pressed it on the top of the mountain, and nothing happened. <laughs> he raised it and knocked on it. It was like knocking on a hollow door. My mother was looking worried. Aunt Beth went out to the kitchen and brought Grandpa a clean steak knife. <laughs> he stabbed it through the top of the pie and carved out a piece, lifted it with the pie server, set it on a plate, and then just stared at the pie. Finally, he rotated the plate so we could all see. And under that golden mountain of crust was airspace down to a sodden, well-cooked layer of apples. My mother was holding her heart in her hands. Grandpa took the steak knife. He carved out six equal pieces, no leftovers, passed them around the table. We all waited. And at the same moment, we took our first bite. <clears throat> Eyebrows flew up around the table. My father said, <coughs> cloves, quite distinctive. <laughs> Aunt Beth said, I've almost liked cinnamon. I said, the, the nutmeg gives it piquancy. My Uncle Bob, who was never a slave to manners, burst out, has anybody tried the lemon yet? My mother was looking down at the table and rocking back and forth. She didn't even look up when Grandpa spoke to her. He said, Marty, Marty, this is a memorable pie. <laughs> I thank you. Their eyes met. The corners of Grandpa's mouth started to twitch. He smiled. And then, in the midst of his bereavement, he burst out laughing. My mother didn't crack a smile. She looked right back at him, and she said, You're welcome. <laughs> Tomorrow, I'll bake you another one. <laughs> and she did. And it was better. And over the years, her apple pies became delicious, and she became the official apple pie baker of the family. But she could never serve one without somebody muttering, has anybody tried the lemon yet? <laughs> Thank you. Mandatory. I'm going to close with a couple of very different poems. <clears throat> Strikes me, given our wake up and smell the poetry, they're actually appropriate 
in a certain way. Um, these are poems based on my fondness for Jewish morning blessings. In Jewish faith, you wake up and you thank whatever is out there to be thanked. You have many choices. Um, you thank them for the day, for your life. And in the most common of morning blessings, the moda ani, you thank God for returning your soul to you, which is, I think, quite, quite interesting. So I have been writing morning blessing poems a little bit this past year, particularly ones that let me see my home area of Western Maine through a kind of Jewish lens. And I'm going to share two morning blessing poems to end waking up and smelling the poetry. Uh, the first one has an epigraph that uh, is the blessing, lift up your eyes and see who created all this. Seu marom enechem uru mi vara ele. Seu marom enechem uru. Even before I open my eyes, I know the woods are full of life. Shrill squirrels, sardonic jays, a honking goose flies up the lake, crows are discussing something nearby, and that woodpecker, nature's jackhammer, must have bored clear through that tree by now. It's when I open my eyes that I see the quiet ones, the waiting ones, the little birds, finches, nuthatches, chickadees, titmice, and I know it's time for the new morning ritual, put out the bird feeder. It's a new ritual because of the bear. She came last Sunday night, darker than the dark, a massive black shape even under the deck light, a fluid, moving nothing. Feeling ridiculous, I stood barefoot at the screen door. Shoo, go away. That's bird food. She forgave my insolence, strolled over, raised her huge head, and studied me. I noticed that her chin was brown, not black. Her dark eyes glinted under the light. Her teeth, was she smiling, were white. I mended my manners. Good evening, I said. She stood tall, pivoted with astounding poise, embraced the bird feeder, glanced back at me once, gracefully stepped off the deck and rode the feeder to the ground as its iron hanger bent into a new arc. I have not seen her since, but each night as I bring the tooth-dented feeder indoors, I scan the dark for her darkness and apologize. Mi vera ele. And then I'll end with morning blessings three. <clears throat> oh God, dear God, this morning you return my soul to me in a miasma of skunk. Sudden, sharp, everywhere, the musk of rage. Nearby, a small striped David has stamped his feet at Goliath, mooned the giant, and loosed his one projectile to mark and banish the looming dog, bear, fox, coyote. Across the lake, wisps of mist rise toward the clear, quiet mountains. In silent ballet, two hummingbirds pirouette through the pine branches. Thank you. Two hawks, St. Valentine's Day. Two red-tailed hawks ride a winter thermal above our cul-de-sac. Gray underbellies, spangled black, they appear a matched set, indistinguishable from this earthbound angle. Though neither of us here below can claim with credibility to know their story, we nevertheless stand with shaded gaze, 
and wrestle an ancient anthropomorphic longing to read within their apparent pattern of part, real, reunite, an aerial pas de deux, a minuet of touch and distance. And so, thus moved, I propose, in honor of this bleak occasion, on the downslope side of a cold, cold season, we cast reason to the wind and give full sway to folly. Let us pretend they are in love. Pretend just for today that they are, as we once did dream we'd always be, enraptured dancing. Thank you. Anyways, um, I recently learned by recent example that Social Security has afforded its recipients a much overdue increase, modest at best, but by the one example I heard, my first reaction was a little bit tongue-in-cheek of a hmm, followed by the following. Got a $6 raise today, this per month. Organic avocados, $3 each. There's always a prize inside. Life for two. Thank you. <laughs>